name is John Daly, and I've got a secret. From New York, here is I've Got a Secret, starring Steve Ellis. Okay. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of I've Got a Secret. Now that you've met our special guest for the evening, Mr. Daly, let's meet the members of our panel, who are, of course, Betsy Palmer, Bill Cullen, Bess Meyerson, Henry Morgan, oh, and that's our panel. <laughs> now may we have our first contestant, please. to have you with us. Would you tell us your name, please, and where you're from? Dick Munsell, San Diego, California. Mr. Munsell is uh, quite an unusual uh, fellow. To begin with, he flies unusual airplanes. I'll show you exactly what I mean. <laughs> That's pretty unusual, isn't it, for an airplane these days? And he also goes to uh, unusual lengths to do unusual things with these old planes. For example, uh, staging World War I-type dogfights for motion pictures, county fairs, and that sort of thing. And uh, the old, uh, you know, barnstorming, uh, crazy stunts that you've seen of this kind. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk tonight about uh, one incredible stunt that I uh, personally have found absolutely unbelievable. So with that introduction, Mr. Monsell, if you'll whisper to me, we'll show the audience just what your secret is. to Mr. Munsell's secret uh, concerns one of his stunts, as I said, and we'll begin the game with Bess Myers in this time. Uh, Mr. Munsell, do you do this stunt inside of a plane? Well, I'm inside flying. You are. Flying. And is it one of the old-fashioned kind? Yes, it is. Uh, do you get very high in it before you... <laughs> he has to before he'll go up there. <laughs> <laughs> Now, shall I pursue that question, or shall I just let it laugh there? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but no. Are you off the, do you go off the ground in order yes, to Yes, we do. All right. And are you at a high elevation? Yes, we're... Uh, uh, nothing unusually high, if that's what I you meant, Bess. Uh, $20 down, Henry. Mr. Mitchell, do you do this with anybody else? Yes. Uh, would, it, would it be a... Uh, would we call it a stunt man or a stunt woman? It can be called that, yes. Uh, not a professional stunt person, however. Is the other person on the outside of the fuselage? Yes. Like out on the wing? Yes, he is. And it doesn't have to be a professional? <laughs> <laughs> well... It should be, actually, but I mean, it could go either okay, way. Okay, no, really, what I'm going for. Is this, is this secret about what that other person does from the, on the out, out on the wing? In a sense, in a that's sense, part of it. Part yeah. of it. Right. Is, there, is there only one out there? Yes. Okay. Now, does this person leave the plane at any time? <laughs> no. <laughs> hmm? I certainly hope not. Oh, no. $40 down. Betsy? Uh, does this person perform an acrobatic stunt on the wing of the plane while you're flying? No. No. Uh, does this person ever come back into the plane? Or do you land with that person on the wing? No, we land with him there on the wing. You take the off with the person The person would probably like to get into the plane, <laughs> but yes. uh, no dice. Do you take off with the person on the wing also? Yes. And that's still not the secret? <laughs> that's part of it. That's part of it. $60 down. Dick, am I interested in what you do with the plane while that person is on the wing? No. The person just goes out on the wing, and now are we interested in what that person does out there on the wing? Well, mm, no. You already know what is done, pretty much. They're just standing out there, and we don't care what you do with the airplane. What is it? Who is that person who's out in the wing? That's the question. <laughs> are they real? Yeah. Yeah. Himself. Oh, you just let the airplane fly by yourself, and you go. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not buying that, girl. <laughs> is it a relative of yours, Dick? No, it is not. Is it a famous person? Yes. 
Have you done it more than once with this person? No. This is the first it Steve? Yeah. <laughs> A while back, uh, Bill, when I was doing the late night uh, television show, Mr. Munsell performed what I consider one of the most remarkable feats in aviation history when he flew this airplane, which is about 50 years old, by the way. Uh, up into the uh, blue California sky with the uh, with me there, as you've already figured out. And uh, Mr. Munsell, why would an intelligent man like you let me do a stupid thing like that? <laughs> well, I knew it was safe, Steve. You did. Yes, I did. Well, I'm glad somebody did. Do you remember how high we got when our altitude was? We were about a thousand feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I uh, actually I was a little nervous when we landed, and I forgot to ask a lot of those details. Well, if for no reason but to, uh, to salve my pride panel, I'm going to show you a little... Yes, Henry? Uh, you, you really brought it up, Steve. Why did you do it? <laughs> At the time, we had a series of uh, yeah. death-defying stunts on the show, and each day I'd come into the office and say, what's up today? And they'd say, you're going to marry an alligator or something. You know? <laughs> so that day it was, you're going to walk on the wing of an airplane. And I just did it because it was my job. <laughs> Now then, we have this little bit of uh, film here. We're going to show you the whole frightening thing. Not the whole thing, but, you know, a minute or two of it. So you guys can roll the film whenever you uh, have it all cranked up. He, Mr. Munsell feels this was just a routine flight. Is that right? That's right. All right. Here I am about to, uh, about to drop dead, actually. Isn't that an adorable scarf? Just like Richard Arlen. Here we go. Take <laughs> off. Mr. Munsell at the controls, of course. Rather bumpy field. And uh, how fast were we going, sir, when we took off there? It was about 60 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Just about at that point, I discovered that the helmet strap was not fastened, so I had to fly with my hand on top of it here. This view was taken from another airplane, obviously, at about 1,000 feet. I had to hold the darn helmet on my head all during the trip. And it really clears up your sinus cavities, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm breezing along up there. It's kind of a windy day. We dropped down there into an air pocket had a little lint in it, I think. Now we're landing. And uh, you'll notice one quick panicky wave here. Jaunty Jolly, there we are. And <laughs> grab my head and my Clyde again there as we come into a stop. That's my insurance man running in front of the plane. Now. <laughs> and uh, at this point, I get my uh, goggles and helmet off and run forward to punch my manager right in the mouth. <laughs> Did you have a parachute on? A parachute? I'd be afraid to jump in a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> I just trusted my friend, Mr. Munsell. Oh. You've now gotten out of that racket, I understand. Yes. I see. And you're now flying for whom? Uh, Mr. Copley. Copley Newspapers. Out in California. Yes. Well, we're very happy to have had you with us tonight, and uh, it's been interesting reliving this harrowing experience. Thank you, Mr. Munsell. in a minute with our next contestant, uh, but first, get a load of this. Bill was just saying that uh, he figures Mr. Munsell got the job uh, flying for Mr. Copley because Mr. Copley likes to fly out on the wing like that, too. <laughs> the only way to fly. Now, may we have our next contestant, Western. please. Nice to have you with us. And would you tell us your name and where you're from? Bob Armstrong from Knoxville, Tennessee. Mr. Armstrong is the uh, president of the ROW, R-O-W-E, ROW Moving and Storage Company. And uh, his secret uh, panel concerns uh, his career with that company. Now, he started out as a salesman for the firm back in 1955. And he uh, attributes his success to two important events that led to his becoming president. Now, the first took place in 1957. So if you'll whisper to me, sir, we'll show the audience what happened in 57. Uh-huh. And now the next date you gave me was 1962. What happened in 62? Good for you. <laughs> the clue to uh, Mr. Armstrong's secret concerns what happened to him, of course. We'll start the game with Bill Cullen. Oh. 
Uh, Mr. Rowe, do these two events... Mr. Armstrong. Armstrong. Oh, Mr. Mr. Armstrong, president of Rowe. That's right. Mr. Rowe, president of Armstrong. Do, <laughs> do these events, just on a wild guess, have to do with famous people or person? No. Uh, does it have to do with the moving business? Uh, no. Not at all? And, and yet you got to be president because... Well, there is, there is that obvious connection, but nothing about moving stuff. Like no one or it no It could have thing. been any company where this happened. Were these things that happened deliberate, uh, Mr. Armstrong, as opposed to accidental? Uh, yes. You, you set out to have these two events occur? Uh, not necessarily, no. Uh, one yes and one no there, Bill. Twenty dollars down. Best? Uh, Mr. Armstrong, did somebody else set out deliberately to have these things done to you? Uh, it's yes and no again. Yes and no again. <laughs> Really. Uh, then there's another person mentioned in at least 1957, let's say. Is there? Uh, not precisely. Not precisely. Another person was involved, but not mentioned. Was it some physical feat you did that impressed the chairman of the board or the president? <laughs> no, that was my cousin. <laughs> that was your cousin? Yeah, Jack Armstrong, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> was it something that uh, happened to you in spite of yourself? Were you, were you rather unhappy when it happened? Yes. Forty dollars down, Henry. Do you have any uh, relatives in this company? No. You didn't marry the boss's daughter or anything like that. No, sir. <laughs> now, is this correct that something happened that made you unhappy that helped your advancement? Uh, yes. Was it uh, something that happened to someone else? No, to me. Were you, were you drafted? <laughs> no. <laughs> Sixty dollars down, Betsy. Mr. Armstrong, did something happen to you physically? No. Mentally? <laughs> it's uh, one of those things where both questions are oddly enough kind of irrelevant. But you weren't happy when this happened to you to make the advancement. Uh, I was not happy. That's you was not happy true. about what happened in '57. In '57. Well, how about '62? Were you overjoyous at that point? Well, let's don't put it over Joss, but let's say that I was happy about it. Did anybody die? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> Did anybody get very sick? No. No. Well, this was a bit of a tough one, panel. When Mr. Armstrong joined the company back in 55, uh, I don't think anybody would have guessed that in uh, seven short years he would rise up through the ranks to become the president. Nobody would have guessed that because after his first two years with the company, they fired him. And now, Mr. Armstrong, I've heard of success stories, but this is really doing it the hard way. Now, how does somebody get to be the president of a company after being fired to begin with? It's sort of a long, hard road, but, uh, road, but uh, at that time, I sold my home and moved to Nashville, Tennessee, and started a uh, small business in Nashville. And in 1962, I heard of this business, part of the portion of this business that I worked for in 57 was up for sale, and I purchased that portion of the business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember now, after all these years, why you were fired in the first place? It was a little vague at the time, and they never really gave me a direct answer of why. But well, that, uh, after you took over and became the boss, did you try to find out then, and were you able to? Well, I don't think anybody would bother telling it then. <laughs> I see. Well, uh, let this be a lesson to all bosses. Never fire a promising young man uh, without a very good reason. I think that's very good advice. Mr. Armstrong, thank you so much for being with us. Good night. Our special guest for the night, our good friend John Daly, in a minute after this message. Now, according to the uh, morning journal here, we're having a blizzard in New York. Before any of you start telephoning the Weather Bureau for confirmation, uh, I'll just say this. Let's wait till we meet our special guest for the evening. He's the host. I'll be right out. <laughs> There's a call for me. He is the host, as I was saying, of What's My Line, Mr. John Charles Daly. Henry, nice to see you all. Well, John, as all these New Yorkers know, this is not a very accurate paper. What's the uh, explanation here? Well, it's not really inaccurate, Steve. Uh, actually, this is, uh, well, we're about 79 years late. Oh, this I is see. a photograph of an actual newspaper that uh, appeared here in New York City the morning after the famous blizzard of 88. You notice the date? 
uh -huh. March 13th, 1888. It's a special snow sheet, special edition, yeah. icicle edition, price one cent. Hmm, those Things are the days. Yes. You know, the slow terror, New York tied up and cut off by the storm. There's one uh, headline here particularly interesting, <clears throat> panic in midair. Yeah. Camel. Yeah, Camel. Uh, panel, you got any idea what this? No, I noticed it, and I, they weren't flying around in 1888. No, Not, uh, no LSD in those days. <laughs> <laughs> Could it have been a, a fire and firemen up in the air? No, no fireman up in here. A balloon. 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 Betsy said balloon. balloon. No balloons. Shall I reveal oil? A, yes. Um, Zeppelin. No. 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 Here's the story. A fatal collision on the Third Avenue elevated. <laughs> so ah. the engineer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. Good old uh, I'll tell you now, as you can uh, probably already figure out, panel, we have uh, a number of other uh, reproductions of newspapers on the easel that John has brought in this evening. And uh, they're all uh, featuring very important front page stories, and they're all collected in a book which is titled The Story of America as Reported in Its Newspapers. John's going to read excerpts now from these other uh, front pages, and it's up to you to figure out which historic event they describe. John, what's the story now? All right, will you remove the blizzard, Steve? This all is right. a story from the Richmond Inquirer. The headline says, To Arms, To Arms. And the story begins by saying, quote, a blow is struck which must rouse the most listless and incredulous. Prepare, prepare, the Philistines be upon you. Any ideas, uh, Beth? Bill, who's first? Oh, it's all right. Oh. Was it uh, the announcement of a war? Beginning of a war? We're going to let the, uh, have the people at home already seen it? I can't see a monitor myself at the moment. At home now, they know what the answer is. Oh, I got an idea. Did, did it have anything to do with the end of Prohibition? <laughs> to do with the end of Prohibition. Yeah. No, that was incredulous, but this has nothing to do with the end of Prohibition. <laughs> was it war? Let me give you another, another clue. It was understood that the Council had met and were debating to send terms of capitulation to the merciless enemy, and there was another rumor that they would offer a million dollars to be spared. Does this happen back in our colonial times? No, I don't think we could describe it as colonial. Mm. You, Steve? No, but you're moving in the right direction, historically. I mean, um, further back. Not that far back. Civil War area? Civil War. Era? Yeah. Civil no. Well, I'll give you another American clue. Revolution? This one will give it to you. About 8 o'clock, they heard violent explosions. Thick smoke and floods of light succeeded, which they concluded to be the Capitol and the President's house devoted to ruins. Oh, Grant. That's uh, uh, the English uh, setting fire to the White House. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So it was in tongue in cheek. Yeah. Now, where is, here is the headline. In those days, they were very small. To arms, to arms. At length, the blow is struck. You notice that there. Mm -hmm. The uh, fascinating thing to me, Steve, is if you look down in the left-hand corner of the front page, Queen's Drawing Room, despite the fact that we were at war with Britain, or England in those days, mm -hmm. they still reported the gossip. This has to do with Her Majesty's drawing room at Buckingham House. Uh, yeah. The company were conducted into the saloon. The saloon? Oh, <laughs> that rhymes yeah. what they were wearing. It's a typical sort of a gossip, Helen. Yes, sir. <coughs> what is the date of that newspaper? 1812. Mm. <laughs> yes, August 27th, I believe it is. Yeah. Okay, stand up here. You'll see a lot of notices calling troops to the colors, one or two of them noting rather sharply, if you don't show up, you're a deserter, and then look out. Okay, mm -hmm. guess yeah, we leave that there for a bit. We'll hide the next one for just a moment here, uh, and we'll see if we can uh, trick you again. All right, this next story is in the form of an eyewitness account of an important news event. Here's part of the description, quote, from the outer darkness, these points of light look like drops of flame suspended from the jets and ready to fall out every moment. Haley's Comet. That's what I was saying. It's a good guess, but not correct. The audience at home now is being advised by print on the screen as to what the answer yes. is, what the event was. Would you like me to read that again? Yes, yeah. Please, please. From the outer darkness, these points of light looked like drops of flame suspended from the jets and ready to fall out every moment. Looks like they're going to need another... Uh, Give another clue. Out. Many scurrying by in the preoccupation of the first moment failed to see them. But the attention of those who chanced to glance that way was at once arrested. The first gas lamps. The first gas lamps. Very good guess. Very good guess. Yeah. Very close. But uh, keep, keep going in that How direction. about the first electric light bulb? Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, it was the first electric street lights reported in the New York Tribune of March 
No, September 5th, 1882. New York Herald here. Edison's Illuminators. Edison's Illuminators. The first district brilliant with the incandescent lamp. The isolated system is a successful operation. Look at these squigglies here, Steve. They're yeah. interesting. Lisa Zhu's curves. I don't know who Lisa Zhu was. Never met her, no. She had a lot of fine curves. She had a lot of her. Now, these actually have to do with uh, the story on the phonograph. Ah. And they, it says here, I will show you the experiments of Lisa Zhu. And these are vibration, uh, schematic vibration uh, pictures from the tuning fork vibrations at ah. diff different notes. Fascinating. You have another one, John? Yes, we have it's another one, too. Uh, let's see. For this story, why don't we let them look at the newspapers, since right. I think it'll give them enough trouble anyway. As you can see, this event took the entire front page, except for some advertisements on the uh, first two columns and a half. I'll read the headlines. We'll see if you can figure out the story. Here are the headlines. The great battle at rich here's the great battle at richburg mississippi 105 miles from new orleans i will let the audience at home and in the studio see what that event was or perhaps that's already been done there it is <laughs> and another headline I'll give you one more headline because you can't read it that is scenes and incidents of the most remarkable encounter on record any ideas, panel? I think they're going to need another good big hint. Can we ask a question? Yes. As it, was it on the water? No. No. It well, says here, though, the two hours and 30, 13 minutes of heavy fighting. Was it a price fight? Yes, Bill. In those days. Do, do I have to know? Do I have to know who? Yes. Sure. Jack Johnson. No. No. John L. Sullivan. John L. Sullivan. There's a picture. He won the, uh, the heavyweight championship. He was fighting Jake Kilrain. Yeah. And this is the New Orleans uh, Picayune of July 9th, 1889. This is a story of the first 17 rounds, <laughs> and then it bled inside. They fought 75 rounds with bare knuckles, no gloves of any kind. No and Sullivan did not score a, a knockout. Jake just got tired and decided he'd had enough of it. Wise man after 75 <laughs> rounds, too. Yeah. Well, oh, look down here, Steve, I'm, before you take that away. Mm -hmm. Nice little ad down here. It says, opium and whiskey habits treated in the home, inexpensively. <laughs> we can only assume that opium was easily had in those days. Mm -hmm. Yes, they used opium to stop the whiskey <laughs> habit and whiskey to stop the opium habit. <laughs> you want to go to another one? Yes, well, I think we have time. All right, the sub-headline of this story panel reads, Boston passes calmly to new order of things. The Boston Tea Party. No. Good guess. The audience at home now knows what that was. Give you some more clues. Sharp were the contrasts to the spectacles of previous evening. Gone was the zest and sparkle, the brilliant gaiety which attended last night's great outpouring of Bohemia. Of what? Bohemia. Bohemia. Oh. Boston. Must have been an opening of some sort in Boston. Uh, it was the introduction of something? Introduction Passing of a bill? No. no. Was, it, was no. it an opera? No. Was it something in the theatrical I think they need film? another help. All right, one more clue. The report went on to say that there were great empty spaces in dining rooms and that some were closed altogether. The evening witnessed almost sedate contrasts to the bibulous scenes of the preceding evening. Boston. They were really swinging. There's a big party there. <laughs> and then it stopped. Yeah. And, the then, big it and then it stopped. Yes. Yeah. Why did it stop? Why did it stop? Because all well, the tea was in the harbor. No, no. <laughs> they, they, they ran out of liquor and opium. No. They ran out of liquor and opium. They ran out of... They ran out of... Throw it back! Throw it back! Throw it back! Here it is. All bacon goes dry. Boston passes calmly to new order of things. That's... Uh, Pretty good stuff. Look at that I little think. story, tiny story down there, John. Oh, yeah, look at this too, Steve. League of Nations has first session. Oh. And wow. down here, as Steve found this on the page, Coolidge Quarters opened in Chicago. And this is uh, January 17th, 1920, so this is probably the first move to, uh, mm. to uh, nominate Calvin Coolidge yeah. for the presidency and ultimately to the presidency. Well, John, we haven't run out of historic events, uh, but know. we have run out of time. This is the second time now you've done this on the show. I do hope you'll join us again very soon. I think this is one of the most fascinating <laughs> things we do here. John Daly, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back one minute after this important message. I will not buy tape. We're back. Well, sir, <laughs> we just have time left to say uh, thanks again to John Daly. John, we'll see you next Sunday night on What's My Line. Yep.
And we'll see all you folks right here next Monday. Good night, panel. Good, Good night. night. Good night, everybody.